Good evening. I'm Eric Marsh, Executive Director of Whitewater Community Television, and glad you're able to join us for what is going to be a 90-minute edition of In Focus here on Whitewater Community Television's WGTV Channel 11. First of all, for those of you who were watching the Board of Works meeting, um, we will be re-airing the Board of Works meeting. It will re-air in its entirety. If you want to mark your calendars for that, I know that they were opening some bids on the former Reed building, and you may want to see the end of that. You can see that uh, the Board of Works meeting tomorrow night, Friday night at 7 p.m., and then you can see it again on Saturday and Sunday at 6 p.m., and on Monday, 3 a.m., for those of you that can't sleep, 8 a.m., <laughs> noon, and then again at 11 p.m. And it will air at that point in its entirety. We did not completely cut away for it. Someone is still there, and they are recording the rest of that meeting. So if you're interested in seeing the rest of those bid openings, those are the times that you will be able to see those. We're going to do a 90-minute In Focus program this evening. And normally where I'm asking the questions, this is about you being able to ask the questions. We've already gotten some questions in. and. Um, we are taking questions on the phone line that will be up beneath you um, on the screen coming up in a little while. So if you have a question, we're not going to put callers live on the air. One of the things that I made mention about when I was uh, at a couple of the local radio stations, and I appreciate the folks at, at the local radio stations for letting me come in and talk about the show. One of the things that we mentioned is that we're really concerned about people's privacy. So we're going to take your questions via phone. They will be written down and brought up on the screen that way. That way we're not finding out things that we should not know. The topic tonight is the opioid crisis. A couple of weeks ago, and I mentioned this previously, Indiana University, East Pres or Indiana University President Michael McRobbie announced IU's $50 million commitment to uh, collaborate with corporate partners, community partners, to prevent and reduce addictions in Indiana, utilizing IU's seven statewide campuses and partnerships with IU Health and Eskenazi Health, as well as others. The statewide initiative is one of the largest and most comprehensive state-based um, responses to the opioid addiction crisis and largest led by a university. Then earlier today, President Donald Trump declared a nationwide public health emergency to combat the opioid crisis. Without knowing that all of that was going to take place, we brought this panel together to um, kind of answer your questions about what's going on, whether you've got a family member in trouble, whether you feel like you're in trouble, or whether you're just trying to understand what's going on in the community. There is no question, I think, that is too trivial, and I think our, our panelists would agree with that. I think part of this is about the community being able to understand what's going on and then working together to try to do some things with it. So I've got Lisa Suttle with me. You've seen her in a lot of different places. Thank you very much for being here. Yeah. Tammy Scotton and Sayward Salazar. And I'm going to start by letting these ladies tell you a little bit about themselves, who they are, where they work, how long they've been involved in this and what they do. And Lisa, we'll start with you. Sure, absolutely. I um, actually lived in Wayne County all my life. I uh, worked at Richmond State Hospital beginning my career there for 20 years. Um, started there as a psych attendant and moved into a um, supervisor and manager's position and got my RN degree while I was there too as well. And then I went to Reed Hospital about 12 years ago. I truly have worked with the mental health population all of my life, feels like. Been involved in some way or another, but um, probably within the last 15, 16 years, um, moved more towards the co-occurring with the substance abuse and the mental health population too as well. Um, truly have a passion for it. I feel like sometimes it is a population that is underserved, uh, maybe under misunderstood. And so as much as possible, if we can help them and uh, provide them opportunities to get better, not enable, but provide opportunities to get better, that's exactly what I, I feel I can do. So. Okay. We may come back to that okay. statement. Sure. <laughs> Tammy? Um, again, I'm also from Wayne County. Um, uh, started my career at the former Dunn Center as a case manager and uh, also worked at Richmond State Hospital for five years. Um, I have my master's degree in social work from IUPUI and I've been at Centerstone for 29 years. Um, I manage the adult services program, um, which is a treatment program for adults with um, mental illness and substance abuse, either or both, which most of the time is both. And um, so I oversee the staff that provide treatment to um, those adults in our community. Okay. And say 
I'm Sayward Salazar. I'm a regional manager for Meridian Health Services. I'm a licensed clinical social worker. I have a bachelor's degree from Earlham College um, in psychology, which is how I ended up in uh, Wayne County. I'm not originally from here. And um, I've been working in the field, gosh, seven, 16 years now. Um, started at Dunn Center also, um, became a family case manager for Department of Child Services and really started to see um, the beginning of the opiate epidemic um, um, when I worked with them and the effects that it has on children and families. Um, from there, I went to Meridian Health Services as a therapist and um, then became a clinical supervisor and regional manager there. This is a conversation that you all have all been involved in with individuals as well as with groups. It may come up, but what is the one question that you hear most often asked by people? Are we winning? Are we doing any better? <laughs> um, are we seeing improvements? Are people getting better? Mm -hmm. People, people want to know that some of the things that we're putting into place are working. So that's the question that I get a lot. And specifically, that's probably from um, the Heroin Is Here group, which was developed back in November of 2014. So a lot of people, a lot of community members, partnerships with these two ladies too as well, has been around what can we put into place to help people? And so, again, that's a lot of the questions we get. Are we doing any better? Are you hearing the same question? Um, I hear that, but I also hear um, a lot of people wondering why people don't just help themselves. Mm -hmm. okay. You know, there's this belief that um, people with mental illness, people with addiction can just stop doing what they're doing. And if they would just stop doing what they're doing, then we wouldn't have this problem. Okay. What do you hear? I hear a lot of people say, well, they had to do it in the first place. They made the choice to pick it up in the first place. And it, there's really a misunderstanding of how that addiction begins and how people get so far into it that they're lost. And so a lot of people are, are asking, you know, if, if they hadn't picked it up, this never would have happened. And there's a real, I think, frustration with family and anger with family around that situation. So we hear that a lot. Okay. This is about answering some community questions. You see the number on the screen, 973-8587, if you'd like to send a question. If you want to send a question via Twitter or email, you can do that also, and we'll take care of that. Let's go to the first question that we had come in, and let's um, see what we got, and we'll start the conversation that way. What are the drugs of use that uh, seem to be most common in the community right now? Obviously, we're talking about opioids, but there's different things out there. What's the drug of choice right now? Um, specifically, just, I'll, I'll start answering that, but specifically, I would say a couple years ago and within the last two years, it's been more around heroin. And that was probably what really started the talk uh, of what was going on in our community. But I will say, as in the last few months, we're seeing more methamphetamines um, arise in that area. A decrease in heroin. I, um, we just did a um, spot yesterday for Wish TV, and we're able to um, you know, announce that in the last three months, we've not had any mothers at the hospital that are delivering test positive for heroin in the last three months, uh, which is pretty big. Mm -hmm. We are seeing that they're testing for Suboxone and Methadone, the medication-assisted treatment, but um, we are seeing a change, and we are, with that, we're seeing that some others are using methamphetamines, too. So um, we don't know for sure if that's because of all of the information about heroin, um, that they're moving to something else, but also heroin can be very dangerous, too, as well, with fentanyl and carfentanyl maybe being involved with those, too. So just depends, just depends. Um, that, that would be my take on the drugs of what we're seeing right now. So. Yeah, we're, we're seeing a lot of um, clients coming in that are now using cocaine, mm -hmm. but marijuana is like the, <laughs> everyone is using marijuana. It's okay. marijuana and it's something else plus marijuana. Okay. So they identify they're using an opiate and marijuana, they're using cocaine and marijuana, but marijuana is pretty, it, it's a theme across nearly all of our clients that come in, our adults and our kids. Okay. And can be very dangerous to it, it as well because things can be mixed into the marijuana that they don't always right. know about. And uh, we've seen that happen too as well that people will um, say that they're using marijuana but have no idea that there's heroin or fentanyl in the marijuana too as well and test positive for that. So. Right. Yeah. 
What are you seeing? And I know that, that you made a presentation to the um, Common Council yes. a few weeks ago um, yeah. about a new treatment facility. Yes, we have a, a new treatment facility. Um, it's a collaboration between um, Meridian Health Services and DMHA um, and really FSSA. Um, we have a, one of the old units at the state hospital. And we see actually it's been quite a mix. Um, we had a lot of opiate at first and then we had a lot of alcohol come through. Um, and then we're seeing the methamphetamine. Um, we've had several folks come through. So it's really been a, a mix um, within the last couple of months there. Okay. Um, we are going to continue taking questions. Um, we'll go to the next one that, that came up. What do we have that has come in? And some of these questions, again, we've been getting for the last couple of weeks now. Um, so we've been soliciting those. What are the signs, symptoms people should look for um, if they are concerned um, a loved one, I really have to get better glasses, concerned a loved one might have a problem um, with substance abuse? What are, this, what are the signs, and does it depend on what they might be on, what the signs are? I think some of the first signs that people notice is a change in behavior. Um, things are inconsistent. They may be um, more moody or less moody or just something's not right. Something seems different. Um, and then you start seeing changes in their performance in school or in social situations or at work. Maybe they're coming to work late all the time or not showing up at all. And those are really some of the first very beginning red flags that, hey, something's going on here, something's not right. I think it is important to say, too, it's across the board. It's not a certain population either that we see these signs and symptoms in. So mm -hmm. many times people, when they first start to use, can hide a lot of things that you don't think anything is going on. But when their tolerance becomes uh, very high for that drug, then um, you start to see some stealing and money issues and not doing too well with their family life, social life, those kind of things. And that's a huge red flag, too, that something's not right. Um, they usually can cover it up for quite a while, but um, it usually gets to the point of where that's that's what we start to see. So. Yeah, things just start falling apart mm -hmm. in, in all facets of their life. I know you all are on the clinical side. We don't have the police department here talking mm -hmm. about that issue, and we're trying not to make this political, but there are some political ramifications of this. Um, we were talking before we went on the air about the needle exchange program, and that mm -hmm. is a program that has created a lot of controversy wherever it has gone into place here in the state of Indiana. Can you give us a little background on why that particular program was started and what it's designed to do? Um, and, and from a clinical standpoint, what is your feeling when we have lost over the last couple of weeks, I think, a couple of different counties that have pulled back from those programs. What's the, what's the potential ramifications on a clinical side of that? And it doesn't matter who starts. <laughs> Tammy and I can yeah. talk directly about <laughs> right. it, specifically. Uh, actually, our needle exchange program here in the county is uh, a partnership between Reed, um, Centerstone, and the health department. And uh, we both definitely, Tammy more than I, but we both have worked directly in the needle exchange program. And, and the main goal for that is to decrease infectious disease, definitely. That's, that's the main goal of what we're trying to do, provide people with clean, needles so that they're not using the same needles, not sharing those needles, and not having the increase of hepatitis C, HIV within our county. I will take it, I will say that we take it though much farther with the oh, Absolutely. So um, they're coming in for the exchange, but because I'm a clinician in substance abuse and mental health, it's a touch point. So I can have those conversations with them about their addiction or about their mental health problems while they're there that otherwise we may have never seen them. You know, we just may have never seen them in any mm -hmm. setting. Mm -hmm. um, but so it allows us, it allows us, me or whoever's doing the intake to have that conversation with them about where they are, what their, what, what treatment is available, what are barriers to their treatment. Um, and I will tell you that their addiction is only one part of the problem. Most of, well, 100% of them are hep C mm -hmm. positive. They're still using, so they can't get treatment for their hep C. Um, some of these people that are coming in are 22, 23 years old and they have hep C. I mean, they're 
they're just on a downward cycle. They're homeless, mm -hmm. they're unemployed, um, so they don't even know where they're going to get their next meal, let alone where they're going to get their next fix. Um, they're so sick that they just don't know where to turn. So it gives us an opportunity to start addressing with them some of this other stuff like how to get insurance, you know, what, what housing opportunities are available for you, where you can get a meal, you know, where you can get shoes. <laughs> you know, they come in week after week, they have the same clothes on. Um, so them coming in gives us an opportunity to touch them and start talking about what all the resources and opportunities are out there for them. And the majority, too, adding on to that, almost all of them have some anxiety or depression. When you hear mm -hmm. their stories, uh, much of what is going on with them started because of things that have been occurring in their life and not having access or knowing where to go for those yeah. kind of things, too, as well. So yeah, the trauma is, uh, the trauma in their life, yeah, it's massive, mm -hmm. what they've been through. There's a, a huge misunderstanding, I think, in the entire community about what needle exchange is and the purpose of it. Okay. You know, people will say, well, how many people are, are not using because of the needle exchange? That's not the purpose right. of the needle exchange. That is a effect of the needle yeah. exchange, that people will go into treatment because they've come in a, a safe place and they know they can talk about their addiction and they're offered treatment options every time that they go in. But it's really about public health and public safety. You know, going back to, you know, think about Chicago in the 1800s and people were just, you know, throwing their sewage into the streets and people were dying. Well, there was a change of behavior that occurred, so people no longer died. That's a public health issue. And so I think that there's a misunderstanding that this is a public health issue and it affects everyone because one person with hep C can pass that to another person mm -hmm. that Very can quickly. pass it to many more. And they're passing it to people outside of the drug using community. And that's, I think, a misconception that we'll just keep it in the drug using community. It affects everybody. How is it passed? Maybe, and, and, and maybe that is some of where the misconception or misunderstanding is. If we don't all know what hep C is, if we don't all know how it gets passed, then that makes it difficult for people to kind of wrap their head around exactly what's going on and why this is or isn't important. Sure. D dirty needles, of course, and that mm -hmm. can be um, a needle that's dropped in a sandbox in a playground or something like that. Of course, it depends on how long it's been there, specifically related to HIV and hepatitis C. But again, those are ways that it can be transmitted. Of course, specifically if people are sharing needles, that's a big way too as well. Um, we talk with people about birth control on purpose because we want to know if you're having sex, is it protected sex? Because that's another avenue too of a way that you know things can be transmitted. So, um, and I don't, I don't think people really understand that. It's really, if, if it could be called something else besides just needle exchange or syringe exchange because that's what people look at, that that's what happens there and Correct. that's it. It's really about harm reduction and about, you know, reducing that, um, I don't know, accessibility or exposure mm -hmm. to the needles that can cause a lot of problems. But why is the thought, if we just keep it among those people, then not a, if I'm not using a needle, and if I don't pick one up on the street, if I come past one, then I'm okay, right? Well, not really. I had an employee okay. that was stuck. Um, she was in the home of somebody. She was helping her organize her paperwork and she was a diabetic and her syringe happened to be underneath a folder and she went to pick up the folder and she got stuck. So, so anytime you could, could happen. Yeah, you, you can know. get stuck anytime. Mm -hmm. Not knowing that a needle right. was there, parking lots, different places where they're just dropped, um, any of those things. So I, just by accident, people And it increases yeah. risk for first responders coming to the scene where mm -hmm. there's bodily fluids. So if we can reduce that risk for everyone, it's better mm -hmm. for the entire community. Mm -hmm. You're watching In Focus on Whitewater Community Television's WGTV Channel 11, a special 90-minute edition of In Focus as we answer your questions about uh, the opioid problem here. Obviously, it is not just a Indiana or Richmond or Wayne County problem. It was declared a public health emergency earlier today. This is a nationwide problem, and there are problems in, in many other places. Your questions are being taken. If you want to call in a question, 973-8587, the number there on the screen. You can send an email 
email wctv at iue.edu or you can send a tweet at WCTV info and we'll get your questions up because these ladies are here to actually answer your questions. So I won't ask another one. We'll go to the next one that is up. Do you acknowledge that giving out needles promotes use or is it a misconception? We touched on that a little bit, but do you acknowledge that it promotes use or is that a misconception? I believe it is a misconception. Um, and the reason why I believe that is, is this is not something that we just came up with two years ago. There's been 30 years of research that has shown that the needle exchanges actually help people get into treatment because it's a safe place for them to go to. And so we're not encouraging use. They're going to use whether we give them a needle or not. Um, we're giving them one that's not going to kill them. We're giving them one that's not going to spread disease. And we're giving them an opportunity to talk to someone who, like Tammy, who can say, hey, would, do you want to go to treatment today? Let's, let's get this started. Okay. Um, as you look at the problem and you said the, 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 f the question that you see most often or hear most often is, are we winning? As you look at that particular program, and obviously it's going to be every year, every six months or so, it gets evaluated for how, it, how it's working, how it's going on. How do you evaluate, how does the community, should the community evaluate that program going forward as to whether it is an effective program that should continue in this particular area? And obviously we can't speak to the areas that have already dumped it, how do we evaluate it? What should we be looking for? Well, because the program is to address the hepatitis mm -hmm. C issue, we would be looking at a reduction in numbers of people with hep C. Now, of course, the numbers are going to go up because we're testing more people also to begin with. Mm -hmm. in the beginning. But over time, we would expect that then those numbers to start to go down. What were the numbers like at the beginning? So just for someone who may not know, and, and I don't know, I think they were Obviously, they were high. I heard that this particular county was relatively high, even on a statewide basis. Um, but but what were those numbers like percentages um, that we? Yeah, I, I would we not know? be able to know. just. I'm okay. sorry. I wouldn't want to give a wrong number. Or anything. Yeah, I, I thought it was on one of your infographs. No. Oh. Not, yeah, I don't. Okay. I don't know. Um, how long should that program be in place? before we begin, and I understand the rise, you're testing more people so you're seeing more, at what point do you think there should begin to be a downturn? Two years, three years, what's the kind of time frame that generally speaking, nobody's holding you to anything, but generally speaking, what has been over the 30 years that you all have looked at this kind of the norm? I would think, I mean, you mentioned two or three years. I don't think in two or three years we're going to see a huge turnaround in it, in yeah, anything okay. that we're really doing. Um, it, it's going to take a while. And there's been several people in our community talk about that specifically, that it's not a problem that we're going to be able to solve in the next few years. And we're really going to have to look at generations coming up of what we can do to put prevention in place and those kind of things. A lot of the things we're putting into place right now really just are kind of a Band-Aid, I would say, in some trying to slow it down as much as possible. But we're really going to have to do a lot of prevention to get things put into place and to sustain that throughout the time. So um, I don't know. I don't know that we can answer yeah, that. I do don't, anybody I don't. feel that? Interesting. Yeah. I heard that same, a comment similar to that. Um, Senator Joe Manchin mentioned we're losing generations mm -hmm. of right. people to this. Yeah, and, I, yeah. and I think that may be one of the things also that is not completely understood how long this has been going on, the length of time it will take to get out and to turn this around, and that it's not an overnight problem. Right. right, right. Next question up that we're going to go to. And again, if you have a question, you can give us a call, 973-8587, or you can send us an email to wctv at iue.edu. Do we have another question that's come in? Okay, what should someone do if stuck by a needle? You mentioned someone who had been accidentally stuck mm -hmm. just helping someone. What is that next step? Well, definitely if they have a primary care physician, they would yeah. want to be speaking with them directly. If not, I'm sure, you know, speaking with the health department, talking with them about what should I do next. They can call the emergency room and say, I've been stuck by a needle. What should I be following up with or what should I, what should I do to, you know, get tested or uh, find out what may have happened? Um, should they try to hold on? 
to that needle? Should that needle itself be tested? What is the, the procedure that they should follow if that's the case? If Whether they're in or out of, the, of a home. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if someone is stuck with a needle, they're going to be tested. Mm -hmm. And then they're going to be tested at regular intervals for a period of time. Um, if they're positive, there will be protocols, protocols to follow. And then if they're negative, then, then they'll told, they're told when to come back and get retested. And those tests so. will continue over about how long a period of time until they can feel relaxed, comfortable. Yeah. There know is that. a certain amount of time because yeah. it can be a false positive and they want to make sure that that's not what happened during the first time. So there will be retesting that occurs, but it, it really is individualized on each yeah. person of what they'll do. So. What are some of the changes that have taken place in this community over the last few years as far as um, treatment facilities, the ability for people to get help. If, we, if we're trying to get people, there's always been conversation of there aren't enough beds. If we were able to take one third of the people that were addicted and could take them to um, a recovery center, we don't have the beds to do that. How has the treatment center and the treatment issue improved over the last few years from where it was to what it is now to even as you look, what might be coming online here in the next little bit? Well, I'll specifically talk with, about that just a few minutes. Um, several years ago, of course, at the state hospital, there was a service line that was just for substance abuse patients, voluntary and, and involuntary. And actually, I worked there during that time. That service was closed, and for many reasons that that occurred, um, we definitely felt that effect in our community, and I would say in surrounding counties, too, as well, through the community mm -hmm. mental health centers and just people being able to go to a place for treatment. Um, since then, has become very apparent that we need services, and there's several several people in our community that has worked on that. And I'll name just one, specifically um, County Commissioner Marianne Butters, who has really worked very hard to connect with people, bring things to our county, and help get things started. Um, you know, I, I, will, I will say the funding is still an issue um, about where people can go and what insurance they have and what's available for substance abuse treatment too as well. But at the same time, we have a very rich county with two community mental mm -hmm. health centers within this area, a state hospital. Um, we have Recovery Works that opened at 1 and 70 um, in February, I think January or February. Um, so there's a lot of options. And so we can talk about that there's, there are options, but um, what I've seen too is that there really has to be a commitment from the patient too as well, because we can have those services available, but until really a person is willing to make that commitment and say, I want help and I want treatment, having all of those beds aren't going to make a difference because they can go for the treatment, they can ride through it and leave and go right back to what they're doing again. So it's really important that there is a commitment on that patient's part too as well. Right. Um, I think that there there has been a great evolution of treatment resources um, during the past few years. One starting with the collaboration of lots of people in our community. Mm -hmm. I mean there are groups of people that are meeting all the time to try to talk about what are the options, what can we do, you know. So there's lots of conversation that happens, is happening amongst people. Um, also with medication assisted treatment, that's really become mm -hmm. very available for someone with an opiate addiction. Um, the assistance with the bridge device for um, withdrawal is available now for people that, you know, can qualify for that. Um, and then there's just through the um, prosecutor's diversion program, um, <clears throat> you know, to encourage people to get treatment as an alternative to incarceration. Mm -hmm. So I just think that there's, there's, uh, there's lots of attention, but the bottom line is it does come back to the person and do they really want the help. And, and, and part of that is their disease, mm -hmm. you know, is being able to make that conscious decision that, okay, I'm going to do this because they're scared, they're sick, they don't know what to expect. They know that if they go through withdrawal, they're going to, it's going to be painful. They're going to be, they're going to feel terrible. Um, so it's that it's, it's easier to keep doing what I'm doing than to have to go through all that work to do something different. And it's really not just about telling them this is what you need to do. It's about teaching them, you know, mentoring them with a different type of lifestyle or different different things that they do rather than hanging out with the same crowd or the same places or those kind of things. It's about teaching them, hoping that they latch onto it 
and that they continue that lifestyle. So I don't want it to sound so harsh that they have to have a commitment and if they don't, then it's not gonna work. You know, what we look for is, why do you wanna change? You know, what's going on? What has brought you to this point that you wanna change? And then that, for us, tells us what stage of change they're in and how we can get interventions to them and help them with that. But it really takes that person of wanting to move forward, definitely move forward. Can people be pushed into this? You've heard about that, that there used to be a TV show intervention or something where a bunch of family members would get together mm -hmm. and just kind of really talk. Does that way work for most people or do they go and then kind of fall out? You're smiling. It, it works for some people. Yeah, it does. Right. And, and that's the problem with this disease is that, you know, if you have diabetes, here's the protocol. This is what you do. These are the medications you take. This is how you test your sugar. With addiction, what works for me may not work for mm -hmm. someone else. It's, yeah. it's whatever works for you. So for some people, they need that push and they go to treatment and they say this is what my family wants me to do and I'm committed to them and I'm going to do this. For other people, they're like, this isn't yeah. going to work for me. I needed something different. And I would say the variety of services that we've been looking at in the past few months has been really nice, and one of them being Senate Bill 499. I don't know if you're familiar with that. I'm but not. Um, Jeff Rotz has been a huge uh, person that has been very proactive in getting that moving forward and helping, and there's a group within the community working on that. But specifically, it is for patients or people who have overdosed and had Narcan several times um, and present to the emergency room where um, then there will be, that will be looked at, their case will be looked at, and a decision made, do we need to detain this person, legally detain them because they are a danger to their self because of their substance abuse, and send them to treatment. And Marion County, Tippecanoe County, and Wayne County were three counties that received grant dollars and a pilot to move forward with this. So there are dollars available for us to do that. Um, I agree with Sayward, it is individualized, but I have seen patients within my time who have been forced to go to treatment somewhere under a detention and don't do well, hate being there the whole time they're there. I've seen others that don't do well, but they've had a taste of feeling good, you know, without drugs. Mm -hmm. And whether they don't do well that time or not, they will come back to it sooner or later. And that's the best part about it, that they've had a taste, they know what it's like, and they want to get back there sooner or later. And I've seen others that do well and get through it. So it just depends, just depends. Yeah, I think you it also with that, you have to recognize that relapse is part of Absolutely. recovery. Yeah. Relapse is part of recovery. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. It's, like, it's like a smoker. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. They, exactly. they start yeah. Yeah. trying exactly. to quit. They're around a particular situation, and they inhale mm -hmm. the smoke, the, the whatever trigger. it is, yep. the drink, right. the conversation, and they just go back to it. Mm -hmm. And it's the same thing. Mm -hmm. and, and I think some, it's hard for people to, to connect those two things, mm -hmm. but in some ways, they're both very much an addiction. Yes. There are Absolutely. people who try to give oh. up nicotine yeah. for yeah. years and years mm -hmm. and years, and some are able to do it, others can't. Mm -hmm. yeah, nicotine is highly addictive. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> we have a question up, actually, I guess, that's pretty close to that. I have voices in my ear. What makes people continue <laughs> uh -oh. to use something that could be so dangerous? We talked on that a little bit, but what is, what is and, and people come to this in different ways, mm -hmm. I think. Some, whether marijuana is that gateway for them or not. Others, pain management, I think, for, is how some people have started. What makes them continue? It's the disease of addiction, definitely. Um, and the more people can understand that and that the brain is affected by that and they need to continue to receive that to feel good, um, I think the better people can understand that, oh, that is what's going on or that's what's happening. There's this, on the screen right now, it shows a healthy brain there and then it shows the brain of an addicted person. And the healthy brain has all of that activity going on. On the addicted brain, much of that is slowed down. Um, and again, they continue to take the drug so that they feel like they did when they had the healthy brain. The problem is it gets so bad, it gets so bad that they build that tolerance that um, a lot of behaviors start coming from that and a lot of medical issues definitely start coming from that too because of the years or even short term use of the drugs that they use. I have an employee that says that the drugs basically hijack your brain. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
good way it to put it. It becomes a reflex, mm -hmm. like breathing, yeah. that they need that drug. They think that they will die if they don't have that drug. Yeah. And that's a very, very powerful um, feeling to have in your brain. And so there, it does, it hijacks your brain. And that is the only thing that you can focus on and think about. Because that's the part of brain, the brain that it affects, yeah. is that, just like she said, the breathing, it's like, ugh, I need it. It's, mm -hmm. it's that, that's the part of the brain that the drug attacks. You're watching In Focus on Whitewater Community Television's WGTV Channel 11, spending some time answering your questions about what's going on in our community as far as the opioid problem, trying to wrap our heads around the why, and not only that, but trying to get an understanding of what treatments are available, why certain things are in place. The needle exchange is one that obviously has been talked about and was talked about for a long period of time, has been back in the news because a couple of Indiana counties have decided to do away with their programs. So we're trying to answer your questions. If you have a question that you'd like to have answered by our panel, 973-8587, send an email, wctv at iue.edu, or we're also uh, taking your questions uh, through our Twitter <coughs> feed. Um, more questions continue to come in. So let's Let's bring the next one up. What are some of the what are some of the consequences of substance abuse? Talk a little bit about health, but we can get specific. Um, the breakup of families. You talked about most of the people that you see are homeless. Right. We see yeah tons of homelessness and unemployment. Um, most employers don't want to retain someone that is coming to work under the influence, so they lose their jobs, um, breaks up of families, plus just physically, mm -hmm. um, the human body can't tolerate the drug use forever. There's cardiac problems, mm -hmm. there's brain injury that occurs, there's liver issues, mm -hmm. stomach issues. Um, kidney issues. And specifically to talk about those heart problems, we see at the hospital heart valve replacements that are needing to take place. And you know, I talk about that sometimes that can happen over years, but we've seen people in their 20s, early 20s, that are having heart valve replacements because of their drug use. Um, and some of that can be from using dirty, dirty needles, uh, not using good practices, and of course the infection, infection occurs around the heart, and then that replacement needs to occur. We're also seeing though that that can happen with the older population too, and when I say older, 50s or 60s, because of the long-term use, and it's not always related to opioids, it can be related to other drugs too that's just taken a toll on their body. Such so, as? Um, cocaine specifically can be one, alcohol mm -hmm. specifically too as well. Um, and, and we see that quite a bit because people that were in their 50s or 60s, that was a drug of choice, you know, several years ago and some have continued um, to use those drugs throughout that time. So. That's interesting because a lot of people don't equate these two problems. They don't equate the use of drink mm -hmm. with the use of, of opioid, they see it in society almost completely sure. differently. That's because you can right. go to a liquor store and you can buy <laughs> liquor, <laughs> <laughs> and heroin is illegal, definitely. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it, 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 there is. I mean, in the in the minds of people, there is a difference with that. So. But the consequences are so Absolutely. often the same. Right. You know, mm -hmm. losing your children, losing your job, losing your home. You know, I've had people sit there and they have nothing left. They've mm -hmm. lost everything, and that's you know their bottom. That's their rock and bottom. Both are very yeah. addicting. Very. I mean, there's no. Yeah, mm -hmm. No. Yeah. Mm -hmm. One doesn't pull rank over mm -hmm. another. Mm -hmm. And the next question that we have, we'll just keep moving, and we'll try to get as many questions and answers in as we can. What should a loved one do if they think someone has a problem? We talked a little bit about that intervention type thing as to whether they should try that or not. Um, but you think you know your loved one, but what I'm hearing is that person has changed. They're not responding to the same things that they responded to in the past. So as a loved one, how do you know how to approach them if they've got a short trigger or something now that they didn't have before? Sometimes people feel okay to reach out to them directly and say, I think something's wrong. You know, how can I help you? Um, I found that there are other times when people don't feel like they can do that and they will reach out to one of us mm -hmm. or people that we work with and say, what can I do? I think, you know, my son, my daughter may be, what can I do? And um, 
you know, sometimes the, the information or what we recommend is that they do reach out, but there are other times we say, you know, let us help. Let us try to talk with them and see what we can do. So I think it just depends on the situation and where that person is at with feeling comfortable with talking with that person directly. It's not an easy, it's not an easy thing to do. Um, and usually by the time somebody's recognizing it, things have got pretty bad. Yeah. Yeah, definitely, I think. And they've probably come to the attention of some something else, the employer, because they've lost their job. We got to do something. You're not working. We don't have any money coming into the house. Mm -hmm. You know, the mortgage isn't getting paid. So it's those other things that can start the conversation mm -hmm. about we need to do something different here. <laughs> And there's been, you know, there was a, a period of time where it was kind of like, you know, shut them off, you know, that'll make mm -hmm. them come around. Yeah. And that has really shifted to, we need to embrace people. And we need to say that, yes, you have a problem. I will not enable that problem, but I will continue to love you. And you are still my family. And I will continue to be there for you. What can I do to help you? How can I help you through this? And really making sure that, that we are wrapping around people and knowing that we're there if they need them. I use the analogy of someone that has, gets diagnosed with cancer in a family. You know, everybody wraps themselves around mm -hmm. them. Mm -hmm. You know, can I bring you a meal? Can I sit the kids? Whatever. But somebody that gets diagnosed with an addiction, which is a disease as well, it's like... Right. Mm -hmm. And usually it's because of the behavior that the person has, yeah. you know, shown. And they burn bridges and mm -hmm. they've really hurt people for uh, some of the things that they've done. So that's that's really sometimes I think that barrier of trying to wrap around mm -hmm. because people have felt like they've been hurt. I and mean, they have been hurt, they mm -hmm. truly have, so. We're gonna take a short break in a little bit. We've been at this for probably closing in on 45 minutes. But I'm, I, don't, I said I wasn't gonna do this, but I'm probably gonna do it anyway. <laughs> we've, we've talked a little bit about the addict for the most part, and some of the resources that have been put in place to try to help people, treatment, things of that nature. Are there resources to help the family members, the people that are dealing with that in this community? Are they kind of forgotten in trying to help those people that are sick, or is there something in this community, people in this community, groups in this community, that they can also reach out to? There is a specific mm -hmm. group that meets on Sunday nights at the hospital, um, the Naranon group, and it's uh, ran by two individuals that are very, very good, very good at what they do, and um, it's free to the community, and it specifically is for families who are dealing with someone um, in their family that has an, an addiction problem, and anybody is invited to that. It's at 7 o'clock on Sunday nights at the hospital. Um, and they definitely are looking to increase that time as the, as the group grows, but that's available. That's one of the things. And then I know the 228 Club is available mm -hmm. for support too as well. Um, I don't know if there's anything else that you guys are Brianna's familiar with. Hope. Brianna's Hope. Right. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And I think they have um, three or four uh, groups that are going on too as well. I've been there directly with them, uh, provided some education for them about Vivitrol and some other things too as well. And um, they have some really good success stories to talk, to tell about too with Brianna's Hope, so. Okay, thank you for that, appreciate sure. it. Glad I didn't uh -huh. blow things up completely by just <laughs> yeah. kind of tossing that one out there. Um, you're watching In Focus on Whitewater Community Television's WGTV Channel 11. We're gonna take a short break and we'll be back with more of your questions. Phil Quinn here. We've got another exciting episode of Access to the Arts where we talk with Lance Crow, who lets us inside and get a sneak peek at the 915 Gallery. You can see the wide range of talents that the artists have in our region. We'll also talk to John Cook. Tickets are on sale. You can uh, go to civichall.com. And revisit our conversation about the Richmond Community Orchestra. You can come to our website, uh, rcoindiana.org. Join us Thursday, 9 p.m. on WETV Channel 20. Because there are dreams of what the future should look like. Because there are questions, but uncertain answers. Because there are basic needs not being met. Because physical activity should be a priority. 
because every child deserves to read at or above grade level. Because you live united, a love of learning is developed. Youth value exercise. Needs are being met. Questions are being answered. Futures are no longer just dreams. Reaching out a hand to one and influencing the condition of all. Together, we can make a difference. Live united. And welcome back to In Focus on Whitewater Community Television's WGTV Channel 11. Our topic this evening is the opioid problem in the community, trying to answer community members' questions. One that was asked of me, actually, while I was out, um, were we trying to upstage somebody by doing this? And the answer to that is no. This program actually was set. We were trying to have it done about a month or so ago, and then some, some things got messed up as you start to try to put a number of people's calendars together. But, um, and, and I'll turn to the ladies here, Lisa Suttle from Reed Health, Tammy Scotton from uh, Centerstone, and Sayward Salazar from Meridian Health Services are our panel this evening. Uh, there have been a number of forums throughout the community, and hopefully, I think, hopefully there will be more. Is this something that can be talked about or explained or over-explained too much to try to go through this? I know there were about 75 people at one forum. Uh, is there a way to continue to bring in the community? Are we still trying to bring the community in? Are there still things that need to be explained? Are there still a lot of misconceptions? I don't think Open we can talk question. about it enough. I right? know. Right. <laughs> we just have to keep educating people about it. And, I, you know, I think it's great that a lot of forums are being put together because some people will feel more comfortable going to this group of people than to another group of people. I don't see anything wrong with that at all. Definitely. I just think the more we talk about it, the better things And there are get. a couple of different ways to approach it. As I mentioned, you all are all from the clinical side of things, but obviously the police department, the fire department, the mayor's office, city government, county government may look at some of these issues completely sure. differently. Sure. So, sure. you know, yeah, hopefully we'll be able to bring in some of those members and speak to it on, on their side of things. I know we've had the mayor in here, and one of the things he said in his state of the city is he can't really deal with this side. He can try to understand it, and I know he's gone to a number of the heroin is here mm -hmm. um, meetings and things of that nature, but from an administrative standpoint, it's about being able to close down the houses, tell the drug dealers they're not welcome, and yep. he's handling it from that end, completely different from the way you all are tackling right. some of these issues. Mm -hmm. and I think it's real important that we respect what they do and they respect what we do. I mean, we have to come to that agreement that, you know, on the medical side, the clinical side, it's about how we work with patients and things, but it truly it's about safety of our community, too, and definitely appreciate everything, appreciate everything they do, too, as well. So I think that has to be there. Okay. We've been taking questions. I've been soliciting. We've been soliciting on um, the Facebook, social media, Twitter for the last couple of weeks. We've gotten some in. Um, so if we can get the next question up, we'll try to get an answer to that. And I'm turning around because it's easier to read this monitor <laughs> than the one in front of me. Um, how effective do you feel faith-based services are in this issue? I think they're very effective. I actually just left the Petra Board meeting with, through uh, Rock Solid Ministries before I came here today. Mm -hmm. And um, some really great stuff that's being worked on there um, at a grassroots level and putting things into place that's definitely going to make a difference. Um, there's also open arms ministries within the community too as well. And I, you know, even though, and I say they may touch just a few people's lives, 
they make a difference. They truly make a difference. And that spreads to other people, those people talking to other people about this is how someone helped me and cared about me and took the time and offered me something when I didn't have anything. And that's truly what those organizations do. So I, I, we can't do it without them. There's no way we can't do it without them. So. Right. I think, you know, like Sayward said earlier, everybody has a different need and how they choose to start their recovery, get their recovery supported, that's very individualized. It's, and we have to respect that. You know, what works for one is not going to work for somebody else. And we, we have to just help the person figure out what is going to be the thing that is going to work for you. Crossroads services, I just want to bring those up really yeah. quickly too, and it's a faith-based uh, residential treatment center, and they do some really great things with mothers too as well, and, and I would say some of them are court-ordered, um, not always around our area, but from Kentucky area, and they have great outcomes, you know, they're just really able to turn people around and, and um, just just get them back on track with, you know, whether it is their faith or, or what that is, but able to turn them around and get them to a better place in their life. So. In, in a lot of um, intakes that are done at, at centers and hospitals, they will ask about mm -hmm. your faith and is that something that's important to you? Is that something that you want in treatment? And I, a lot of people that are in addiction will feel betrayed by their faith or lost and, and you know, it was something I used to have and I don't have it anymore. I don't feel welcome there anymore. So be, to be able to have these faith-based organizations step up and say, we don't care if you stink. We don't care if you're struggling. We don't care if you haven't had a meal in two days. We're here because that's our calling and that's what we want to do. And, and that speaks very loudly yeah. to people in recovery. Mm -hmm. You're watching In Focus on Whitewater Community Television's WGTV Channel 11 answering questions about um, the opioid problem, I guess. That's, that, is that a way to put it? How, how is it actually described? Well, it's an emergency yeah. now. It's an emergency now. It's an emergency now. It was declared an so, yeah. emergency early, a public Absolutely. health emergency. Absolutely. And and that's one of the things that we were talking about on the front side of this is that it 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 is to a certain extent about public health. It is. And and that's why certain things have been put in place and continue to to be put in place around here. That it is about the public health, the general public health, um, and trying to make things better as 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 better as they can be at this particular point in time and this is continues to be an ongoing problem we have a couple more questions that we want to try to get to and then I know that that you have some slides and some various things that you shared with us a little bit earlier that some of that information might be helpful to see too and we've seen a little bit of that as we've gone through this program sure. should mothers stay on drugs while they are pregnant and I'm not sure that that's should they stay on heroin, right. but if, if they're trying to get off, you mentioned that you're seeing a reduction in babies that are addicted to heroin, but you are seeing some of the other drugs that shows that maybe they're trying to wean themselves off. Sure, and, and I think we look at the lesser of the evil, definitely. Um, a baby who withdraws from heroin is um, is really it's really a sad case to see definitely so if we can get them in a program um, where they are on medication assisted treatment and that is a drug too specifically and can be methadone or suboxone then it is an easier withdrawal for the baby um, and and each case is different it depends on if the babies have any kind of medical conditions or anything like that um, but with that, if they're in a program with Suboxone or Methadone, then there are other requirements that they're in therapy. Um, it's a monitored system, so it's a safer, it's a safer type of, um, how would I say, medication that they can be taken while they're pregnant. Again, they need to be seeing somebody OBGYN, uh, that they're monitoring it, but then also somebody who is prescribing the Suboxone or Methadone so that it's at safe levels. Um, and then there's a whole whole other, when the baby delivers, of making sure that everything's safe. There's a weaning process for the baby, even though it's not heroin, it's still an opiate. So there's a weaning process that needs to occur in under medical care that that happens. Um, and then 
you know, what we like to do is hopefully get the mother to the point of not having to take the methadone or the Suboxone, continue to take it. Um, but that is really scary for mothers to stop taking those because, again, the withdrawal can be uh, really hard for a person and um, to just say you're going to stop today and you're not taking it anymore doesn't really happen for people. Um, there has to be a lot of support and other things that takes place during that time. Um, Tammy mentioned the bridge device and that is something that we have helped um, a mother and other patients with to get through that withdrawal and it just really is um, just a, a an apparatus that goes on the ear that helps them to just have um, calming and um, decrease their anxiety during that time. Um, and then there are other medications too, medication assisted treatment that is Vivitrol and that's something that's longer um, acting so they only get an injection once a month uh, but usually they take that up to a year, sometimes 18 months. Um, and again, it, it goes back to the point of everything too, of we really have to support that person, teach them a different type of style of life and get a commitment from them too as well that they want to do that so how do you answer the question and and in going through some of what we've seen we've talked a lot about and some of the questions have been kind of how do we help support how do we take care of what about those questions and I think we may actually have it come up why don't we just put them all in jail why don't we just lock them up? Wouldn't that be easier? Wouldn't that solve our problem? Wouldn't that make our this go away? Say yeah. no. Our <laughs> sheriff would say no. The sheriff would probably exactly. say Absolutely. no. Absolutely. And many would um, say no. And, and that has, and, and the addiction problem has created more problems within the jail. I think when people say lock everybody up, that's when it becomes a moral issue. Mm -hmm. And addiction is not about morals. It's not about people being bad. It, it's about an addiction that, that they really have very, very little control over by the time that it gets to the, the point that we need to intervene. And when people think it's a moral issue, um, their response is, is different um, because they bl there's a lot of blaming. And these are our family members. Mm -hmm. They need help. They need compassion. They need love and they need treatment. Um, and we as a community need to recognize that. That's the difference between compassion and being compassionate and being helpful and enabling somebody to destroy their life and the life of others around them. And you kind of started that okay. <laughs> earlier and I said we'd come back to it and I knew somehow it would just well, there, make its way around. There is a difference between feeling sorry for someone and feel an empathy for someone and, and truly we have to separate that out. Um, but again, it, it can't be so harsh that you put a barrier between you and the person to where they don't get anything. I, you know, I've seen cases where you start out at first you are providing them with everything they need, but you wean them back from that so that the person starts to become independent themselves too. I've seen others, you give them the information and they go with it and they're good to go. They just are, are ready to do it. So um, I, think, I think you have to be able to sort out the empathy part of it related to sympathy and, and try not to do the sorry, but that's really hard to say though too because some of these situations you just think, oh my gosh, how did a person get there? You know, what, can I, what is everything I can do to help them? And that, that's really hard, especially when it's a family member. It is really hard for parents not to want to do everything they can, including giving them money, shelter, all of those things, mm -hmm. no matter what they've done, it's really hard to turn on your kids and say, you need to start doing some of this. We provided you with this, you need to start doing some of that. So it's hard. And you said turn on the kids, but isn't it sometimes the, other the, way around. the parent, yeah, the other absolutely. way around, where, yes, where it's absolutely. happened to someone else and the kids are looking at it going, that's mom, that's dad, yeah, what, what in the world is going on? Yeah, absolutely, right. absolutely. We have seen three generations definitely affected by drugs um, coming through the hospital, so it, it definitely happens. Yeah. You're watching In Focus on Whitewater Community Television's WGTV Channel 11. I'm joined by Lisa Suttle, Tammy Scotton, and Sayward Salazar from Reed Health, Centerstone, and Meridian Health Services. They are here to answer your questions, 973-8587. We did have a question come in about Narcan, and that is something that has been um, talked about a great deal, um, even to the point where uh, in Ohio a legislator suggested not funding that anymore, cutting off funding, and again, that's that, that moral issue that you were talking about, but let's see where this question goes. 
won't having Narcan kits in people's home just encourage people to OD because they know that they can be brought back to life? And obviously the stories of someone being brought back multiple times in a day or within a couple of days have hit. And when those hit, that really just kind of turns the conversation. But what about making a drug like this more available to people? I think any time, sorry, did you? I think any time. Nobody wants to touch this. I, well, no, I can touch it. I think any time you try to put something into place, people will not use it for the reason that it is meant to be used. Um, you know, we have heard stories about Narcan parties where, um, you know, it's there and I'm with you and you're my buddy and if you get too much, then I'm just going to give you this and we're, you know, good to go. It's not what it's intended for. Um, but, you know, you tell the story, though, too, if you're the first one on the scene or you're, it is your family member and you don't have it and that is occurring with your family member or someone that you know, you don't want to be standing there without it. You definitely don't want to be standing there without it. There and, and I don't know how we make the decision specifically about we're going to stop taking that. I, the, we say we're not going to give you that medicine. I mean, it's no different than if somebody's having an allergic reaction or something. Are we going to say, nope, we're not going to give that to you? You know, I, I don't know. That would be a really hard really hard decision to make. There was a police officer in Indianapolis and she told a story at a training about that they got a call about an overdose and she walked in and it was the little boy's fourth birthday party and his mom was laid out on the floor and had OD'd and she said, how could I not save this little boy's mother? How could I not do that? How could I stand there and watch a four-year-old watch his mother die? That's what this is for. This is to give people another chance. And sometimes they get a lot of chances, but how could we not, as, as humans, with <laughs> compassion, not do this? I mean, I, it, it boggles my mind that people could not do that. And, and we hope that with Senate Bill 499, that that's what helps to move these people who have been Narcan several times to treatment definitely moves them, makes them go, so, yeah. To explain what Narcan is. Actually, it's just a reversal agent. Once it's given, it takes it out. And, and usually uh, the person doesn't like it because you've taken them out of the high. But, but when they're found and Narcan is given, um, they're unconscious. I mean, they're going to die. They're going to die if something's not given to them. So, I mean, it's a real easy. We've done a lot of training with the community agencies. I say community, but the county agencies to be able to give the Narcan. It's a mist that goes in the nose. Sometimes people think it's an injection, but it's a mist. Very very easy. Um, we are finding that it's taking several doses rather than one dose um, on people depending on how much heroin and whether fentanyl is involved too as well. Um, and you know we've we've provided a lot of kits at the hospital um, and now pharmacies do provide um, over the counter. There's not there's no need for a physician's order or anything like that. They can walk in and ask to buy the kit. Uh, some is covered under insurance too as well. When you compare the time, and I want to try to say this right, when you compare how long someone is high as compared to what Narcan can do for them, what is that comparison like? So if, if I've been high, if I'm high and I've taken heroin, I'll remain high depending on the dose for hours, I assume. If you give me Narcan, how long will that remain in my system? Not very long, and it's real important that a person gets to emergency help because they can go right back in to the overdose state within 30 to an, 30 minutes to an hour. So it's real important that they get to treatment, I mean get to an emergency room to see um, exactly what's going on, be monitored for a while, and see if they're safe to leave or, you know, what can happen with them from there. But it's... It doesn't, it doesn't keep it out of their system. It will come back. It's just for a short stay to bring them back to, you know, uh, breathing normally and those kind of things. I mean, there's people that after they've been Narcan, they end up in ICU. Yeah, absolutely. It's not just like, oh, they're okay. Doesn't save it <laughs> yeah. and they're no. done. Mm -mm. Is there a trigger that you've seen that makes people who go into recovery walk out of recovery? Have, can you find that point, can you look in someone's eyes and say, and no, they're not about this? Have you seen that with any of you? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think that just comes with experience. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the know-it-alls, the, those tend to be the folks that 
walk into recovery and they're like, I got this, I, I'm good, yeah. I got this. And I'm like, oh, I'm yeah. really nervous you're not gonna get this because it's almost like a, a wall for them, um, that self-confidence and, and they don't want to accept that they don't Good know problem. everything. Yeah. So you that's just, one type of person. Right. That <laughs> you just tell me what I got to do to meet all my probation yeah. requirements <laughs> and then you'll go your way and I'll go mine. And for them, that's pretty much what it's about at that particular yeah. moment. It's right. not necessarily about getting well. Right. It's about staying out of trouble, yeah. basically, mm -hmm. at that but point. But sometimes hearing that, there's an aha moment in mm -hmm. there of that's like, true. oh, my gosh, this just might apply to me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so then, you know, that's what we try to create are those turning points um, through the education, through the groups, through the um, yeah. therapy, is to try to get them to some kind of a turning point. I, I've seen peer pressure be very, yeah. very helpful with people who may oh, come yeah. in saying, this ain't for me, but they, you know, buddy up with someone there or something, and next thing you know, they're right on track with where they need yeah. to be. So the peer pressure is very important. It's part of why group works so well in addictions is because you can't BS somebody that's been down that road yep, before absolutely. and they will call you out. I mean, I have mm -hmm. seen a whole group call out one person and say, you are enabling, you are this, mm -hmm. you are that. Yeah. And they're like, whoa. Yeah. But having that group of people wrap around you and say, we're calling your bluff on this, mm -hmm. it changes people. It, it makes yeah. a big difference for it them. Does. Who's the hardest person to get into treatment? Someone younger, 20, 25? or someone older? Have you seen any difference in how those people react to it? Whether they've been around for a number of years, someone who got addicted, they were 45, 50 years old. Back injury, pain pills, whatever it was, got there, as opposed to someone younger that maybe hasn't seen as much in their life, maybe haven't gone through, haven't raised a family, whatever the case may be. Do you see a difference in how they react to the idea of recovery? of going into to recovery? What I see more are people who have, people who are homeless, people who are unemployed, they don't feel like there's anything invested f for them to invest in to go through recovery, as opposed to someone that maybe got referred for treatment because their employer's like, you know, you, you tested positive, um, you know, your job could be in jeopardy. There's a little bit more motivation, but um, people who just kind of get to the bottom when they're absolutely, they have nothing, sometimes it's hard to get them to buy in a little bit more to recovery. You're watching In Focus on Whitewater Community Television's WGTV Channel 11. We've probably been at this uh, well over an hour now. We're coming to the, to the tail end. We still have, I think, a couple of more questions that we want to try to get to. 973-8587, if you have a question, we can still try to get that in. Or you can send a tweet w, at WCTV Info. Um, if we've got a question, we can bring that next one up and see if we can tackle one or two more. What are some problems? individuals face when trying to get help with dealing with insurance? Mm -hmm. The insurance system is very complicated, mm -hmm. very complex. Especially um, related to substance abuse yeah. and mental health. Yeah. yeah. Um, we have staff that Is it a really, barrier? It yes, is people absolutely. Barrier. Mm -hmm. Some yeah. people will not apply for insurance just because it is a pain mm -hmm. to try to navigate through the application process. Um, if they're homeless, then they have to have an address. If um, there has to be some place to mail the paperwork to. Um, so those become barriers for people, and they just say, I'm not messing with it. So we use staff. I know mm -hmm. Meridian, mm -hmm. the hospital. hospital there's lots of people in Richmond that will help somebody navigate through that insurance nightmare. One of the barriers that we've seen is that HIP. Um, non-state plan does not cover residential treatment at all um, and that's that's a really big barrier for folks so yeah every hip plan covers just certain things yeah <laughs> so okay. if you have hip basic you ba get basic all the way up to the hip state, state plan. plan and so it's trying to get someone many people are underinsured like she said, it won't cover mm -hmm. what they have. It doesn't cover what they need. Mm -hmm. So it's trying to get them the insurance that they do need 
that will help them get the treatment that they need. I assume residential treatment is the best way, quote unquote, to treat someone. And I heard you say that when people come into to your service, you take their phones, your, things of that nature. Mm -hmm. is, is that the best way that you all have found? Cut them off, bring them in, go through that recovery process. For some people, yeah. it is not the best always. way. Not it's always. not always not the always. best way. Mm -hmm. right. mm -hmm. Outpatient okay. can be very beneficial yes. too for people. It just depends yeah. on their support, yep. um, what they have available, um, insurance, those kind of things too as well, but it's different for each person. Right. Definitely. What's the difference in the treatment between the two? Let's talk about that. If you're doing outpatient as opposed to inpatient, what are those two patients going to see, go through, or do differently? Folks who are in residential treatment tend to be folks that have attempted recovery and failed. Um, people who cannot stay sober for any period of time. So people who really, really struggle um, with their triggers, their environment, the people that are around them, they tend to do the best in residential because they really need to be removed from their daily environment and put in a place where all of their focus is towards their recovery and getting better. Um, so that's what we see is those are the best candidates for residential treatment. And for outpatient, people who obviously can handle it, but how is their treatment then different? Or well, it? It, it wouldn't. It wouldn't be quite as intense because mm -hmm. there's not that residential component where they're living there. Mm -hmm. um, they may come in for group nine hours a week. Mm -hmm. They may see a therapist for an hour. They may meet with a recovery coach for a couple hours. So from a twenty, well, maybe not twenty-four hours, but sixteen hours of it's intense a day. treatment yeah. a day to maybe three, four hours a day. And there is more independence, definitely, yeah. for the person on an outpatient basis. And, and some people do very well at that. Mm -hmm. Definitely, if they go in for residential, it's an, an automatic that there'll be outpatient services when they leave. It's, right. it, you know, automatic that they have to be set up for yeah, that. Yeah, you're, so. not, you're not cured in 30 no. days. <laughs> Nobody's no. cured no in 30 way. days. No. Um, that's just the beginning. And, and it's going to take, some, for some people, years mm -hmm. before they really, you know, f feel good in their recovery. You're saying 16 hours a day, if they're in treatment, they're going through something that long during the day? I don't know if it's 16, yeah, like well, 12. Well, you got to have time. Yeah, okay. half 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 day have sleeps and meals. And that type it, thing. It, it is all day long. We try to keep bu people busy all day long because the more time that they have to sit and think, the more time they have to sit and think about getting out of there. Mm -hmm. And I need to leave. I don't want to be here. And it's also about teaching people a routine of life. When Absolutely. you're in addiction, you're sleeping, you're, you're barely eating sometimes, you're going from house to house. It teaches them, get up in the morning, make your bed, have Nutrition, breakfast, all do some things. exercise. Yeah. I mean, yeah. it really is helping folks relearn a lifestyle. Mm -hmm. You're watching In Focus on Whitewater Community Television's WGTV Channel 11, wrapping up our last few minutes with our, our panel. And ladies, we appreciate you spending your evening answering these questions. I know you've probably heard them, some of them anyway, a number of different times. Okay. But um, you can tell how, how you all really care about this particular issue in this community and the people that you're dealing with. And, and I think that helps make you special because it, it's easy for people to make that moral decision, to be callous, to turn things off. Um, 973-8587, if you've got a question, and I'm not sure, the voices aren't in my head, so I don't know whether we have any more. We do have another one, okay. I can no longer receive the pain meds I need because of, of users creating problems. How fair is that? I can no longer receive the pain meds I need because of users creating problems. How fair is that? And we've heard various things. It's harder to buy cold medicine anymore because it was abused and used for things that wasn't meant to be. How do you answer somebody? I'll, like I'll answer some things related specifically to Senate Bill 226, and I know I just you know rattled this Go for it. Just whatever, <laughs> but I live it every That's day. That's why you're so. here. <laughs> um, and specifically, that went into place July 1st, and um, it, the ideal behind that is is that we don't want people to get started on them from the very beginning. So you know, guidelines have been put into place that 
providers cannot write for longer than seven days without some type of justification that a person needs that for a longer period of time. Um, we really want people to know that there's alternatives to pain medication. There are different things that can occur and there are specialty clinics specifically for addressing pain. So um, it's not good for a body to take pain medicine for a long period of time. So it's really important that we're assessing that at all times, not writing prescriptions from the very beginning that would keep them on them and give them alternatives to the pain that they may have. Um, you know, to, in my years of when I went to nursing school, it was always about pain and making sure we were addressing what the person told us that their pain level was. It's a little bit different, it's a lot different now, that we really need to assess where that person is at with their pain, their demeanor, you know, how they're walking, their gait, all of those kind of things, and not so much about what the person actually tells us. There are times that people will have pain um, and it will be there and there, have to, there has to be different ways that we manage it other than taking pain medication. I feel bad for people who say that they feel like, you know, their pain medicine has been taken away because of the people who misuse. Um, it really is not about that. It's specifically about pain medicines are not meant to be taken forever. It's really just during an acute um, time frame. Um, there can be low doses that are given for chronic pain, definitely, but different things can be tried instead of using opioids or pain medicines all the time. So. And there was a huge mismarketing of pain medications, right. of opiate pain medications. You what know, do you mean mismarketing? Well, the drug companies marketed it for everything. Well, we live oh, in a society where you, have you take menstrual a pill cramps, and everything's fixed. Take yeah. some OxyContin. Oh, you have mm -hmm. arthritis. Take some OxyContin. Those medications don't treat the symptom of swelling, mm -hmm. which ibuprofen does. And so it's even looking at... Are we, did we even prescribe the right medications for the symptoms that people had because it was mismarketed so much to the medical community? And the belief that it wasn't addictive. Right. Mm -hmm. That that medication was not addictive. And now we know. <laughs> so there are guidelines being put into place, mm -hmm. and that's not just Indiana, that's across the nation. And each state is a little bit different. Ohio's a little different in that 15-year-olds um, uh, and younger um, their adolescent population is five days. You can't write more than five days. So um, it's different and, and um, well, well needed, definitely, I think, across the board. So. And I wanted you to go a little bit farther with that okay. because, again, as, as I've gone around and talked about this show, one of the things that I've heard three or four times is, why aren't we just suing the pharmaceutical companies? Mm -hmm. Because they knew this was taking place. They, they shipped more pills that could yep. ever possibly be taken. And there's a number of people wanting to lay this at their feet right now. Well, and it's happening. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, a great it's book happening. for folks to read is Dreamland. I don't remember the name of the author. But Sam Quinas. Yeah. The, mm -hmm. it go, it's, it's written. Who was it, I'm sorry? Sam Quinas. Okay. Yep. And Sam it's Quinas. written at um, a newspaper level, so it's very readable for the general population. And he really lays out where this started, when it started, what the drug companies did, how the doctors really became victim to this, um, and just really through the whole thing and, and how the drugs started coming, the heroin started coming into the country and how that, I mean, it is, it just really lays everything out and, and it's, it, there were a lot of aha moments in that book, like, oh my gosh, yep, that's why we have this problem because this is what happened. So. Actually, a county in Ohio, Scioto County is mm -hmm. where it occurred. I actually went there, went to that location just to kind of see what was going on. It's developed within, you know, the last several years, but, um, a lot of pill mills were started during that time, and uh, physicians got a lot of people hooked. A lot of those physicians went to prison uh, because of that. But again, a lot of that, like she said, came from Mexico area, came from Canada. It was right in that location to where it just passed through. Um, and, I mean, caused a lot of problems, a lot of problems for that county. So um, it is a good book, definitely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. We're down to our last nine minutes or so. We've got one more question that we're going to try to get in, and this one I'm told is, <coughs> is going to take a little bit of time to get through. So everybody take a drink of water and let's digest this. Our government has created this addiction problem. I believe by cracking down on pills, you are driving people to heroin and fentanyl. Indiana will be the very last state to legalize marijuana. I believe weed would, um, 
provide some help, but not cure all. America will never throw the amount of money needed to address this. Our current administration thinks more prisons are the answer. Um, the powers that be look to profit. Some of this we've talked about just a couple minutes ago from the addiction problem rather than fixing it. Can we? Here's a question. Can we file a class action lawsuit against U.S. Congress for passing laws that made it more difficult to prosecute drug companies that flooded our country with opioids? If we can't trust our own elected officials to watch out for us, who can we trust? And then as the screen clears and everybody looks at each other going, I don't want to touch that one. Um, how, do, how do we answer something like that? And some of this, Obviously, we just kind of went through some of the history of, of what this question is asking. I actually think that there has been a lot of response, especially in the state of Indiana, to this. The fact that um, the DMHA is covering the cost of some indigent care at our facility at the state hospital is really unbelievable. Um, the Recovery Works program that is helping folks that are coming out of jail and prison receive services um, while they're in that gap period between getting insurance is a big deal. I mean, I think Indiana has really put a lot of money behind this and a lot of resources and has really looked at how can we address this in our community. So. I think that the money is there um, in some cases. Um, it's just getting people into the treatment that will be the, the next step for us. And uh, truly, you can't ignore, too, there is still a stigma associated with this. I have found we have put money into places, but there is still a mindset about the person who has an addiction problem, and then still barriers continue to come up. So there is still... There is still a stigma about addiction and what should we be doing, how far should we go. Um, you know, I get comments sometimes, all of this money is sent out for Narcan, but you know, why can't, why aren't we helping other diseases too just as much or why is it getting as much attention mm -hmm. um, that's taking place right now? I, with the question, I, you know, understand where they're coming from. Um, on the other hand, I would say, you know, it's real important to be talking with your state officials, your county officials, letting them know, you know, where you stand with those things and asking them to push some things forward too. And I have found our officials to be very receptive. Um, not just to me, but just in places where I've been, they've been re really receptive to people and their questions and moving forward with some of the things that they ask. So, okay. We've got um, probably five or six minutes left. I'm going to give each of you a minute. Is there something that we haven't touched on? Is there a question that hasn't come up that maybe you were expecting to see that you've seen a few times before that we didn't get a chance to actually answer? Or is there any information that you want to pass along that we haven't dealt with here in, in just a minute or so each? Lisa? I'll go first, of course. Okay. I uh, do want to promote the uh, drug take back, which is this Saturday. And I, I want to just add a little bit to that. The reason that that is so important is that people, if they have drugs in their cabinets, in their homes, laying around different places, all that stuff, it's very important that they're, if they're expired, not using them or whatever, that they take them to those locations, take them to the pharmacy, whatever, so that they can be discarded. Um, we are finding and hearing that, you know, sometimes that's how things occur. Uh, people are stealing from homes, those kind of things. Or younger kids are just trying some things that are in the medicine cabinet and, you know, it's just not real healthy. So we're really trying to push that forward. And you actually don't want to flush those into the water. You don't want to flush system. them. No. no, absolutely not. So, and we'll be um, providing more information about that in the morning with um, the 101.9. Um, Mark Sutton from the Richmond Police Department will be speaking specifically about that. And that is a huge initiative across the state and across the nation to, to really get those drugs out and discarded. And if you so. miss this one, there'll probably be another one soon because there was one really just a couple of months it ago, was. I think. These are happening almost once a quarter, something yes, along those absolutely. lines, actually. And there is a lot of medications that are being turned in, which that's very, very encouraging to know. So. And you don't have to wait for the take back day. Nope, you know. They have a mailbox down at the at police, police station department. that you can just drop them off any time. And it, you can go to the DEA website, and I did today and just searched 100 mile radius for 47374 mm -hmm. zip code. There were 60 some areas that came up. So if people aren't comfortable with going to the Richmond Police Department to discard, there's all different kinds of locations that they can drive a few miles and get rid of those too as well. So. 
Okay. Yep. Anything you? Well, I just think if people have questions, they need to ask um, and and get involved. The partnership. There's a Wayne County um, Drug Free Partnership that meets. Um, I think it's uh, the. It's this Friday of the month. Tomorrow. The fourth Friday of the month. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, down at the Senior Center. Um, lots of people come together, family members, um, professionals in the community, um, law enforcement, um, you know, to try to um, work on strategic plans to address the problem in the community. Um, so, I, you know, to get involved, ask questions. There I think is it's real important. Just to add to You're that, good? there is a Heroin Is Here group too that meets every other month, and it's the first Thursday of every month, and it's open to the public too as well um, at Reed Hospital at 11:30. We have people that come and then don't come, but then others that join, and it's just really a nice session for people to be very informal and share information about what they have, and we always have a really good turnout too as well. So, just another group. Um, I just appreciate the opportunity for us to be able to come together and talk about this and let people know that there is help out there. There's all different kinds of help in our community. We are very rich in our community with the resources mm -hmm. that we have. Other communities are very jealous of us mm -hmm. um, because we do have so much here. And just to remember that folks can get better and they do get better. And as you look at family members and friends that are struggling, just remember that they are who they are. They're just not who they are right now, and you need to help them get back to where they need to be. And you do that by compassion and caring and making sure they know where they can get that help. Thank you. Thank you all very much. Sayward Salazar from Meridian Health Services. Appreciate you being here. Tammy Scott and Center Stone and Lisa Suttle from Reed Health. Thank you all very much. We appreciate the time. I know 90 minutes seemed like it was going to be a long <laughs> time, by. but we have Flew absolutely by. gotten through it. We're down to our last minute or two. A couple of quick announcements that I want to bring in as we try to bring you some information, things that you can do around the community. Earlham College Department of Theater Arts, November 2nd, 3rd, and 4th. Uh, she Kills Monsters. Um, definitely get out and enjoy that. Again, the third and fourth, and there are a lot of things taking place over the next couple of weeks. This one at the Wayne County Historical Museum, the Artisans Bazaar, the Autumn Artisans Bazaar, juried show, over 20 local artisans, food, music, beer, wine, that's always a reason to go. Wayne County Historical Museum, 1150 North A Street in Richmond. The 23rd season of Civic Hall's proudly presenting series continues on November 4th, 7.30 with the Sun of Serendip. Um, go out and enjoy that. Tickets still available, 973-3350. Richmond Civic Theater's box office is, uh, would love to sell you tickets to see uh, Madagascar. A musical adventure. It is a uh, stage one fundraiser. Again, November 4th and 5th, 962-1816, or check them out on the web, gorct.org. The 19th annual exhibition, reception and awards presentation is taking place at Richmond Art Museum. Exhibition closes on January 13th. They are at 915 East Main Street. You can see more of that particular location if you watch the Access to the Arts show on WETV Channel 20. Thank you very much for watching the show. You can see replays of it tonight at 1030. Then again, of course, tomorrow night, twice on Saturday, twice on Sunday. Thanks again to my guests for joining us. If you want to see uh, this show or have this, someone see the show that doesn't have Comcast cable, it's available on our video on demand site, WGTV Online, which you can get at our website, WCTV.info. Have a good night. Phil Quinn here. We've got another exciting episode of Access to the Arts where we talk with Lance Crow, who lets us inside and get a sneak peek at the 915 Gallery. You can see the wide range of talents that the artists have in our region. We'll also talk to John Cook. Tickets are on sale. You can uh, go to civichall.com. And revisit our conversation about the Richmond Community Orchestra. You can come to our website, uh, rcoindiana.org.
Join us Thursday, 9 p.m. on WETV Channel 20. Whitewater Government Television, Channel 11.